introduced as um, the CEO of Epsera, but hopefully uh, that won't freak anybody out. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about some low-level, high-performance messaging systems that um, I've built in the past. Um, a little bit about me, uh, of why you would even listen to me about messaging systems. Um, my architect and built a lot of the high-speed messaging systems for TIBCO, both Rendezvous and EMS, which was the enterprise messaging system, uh, a JMS system. Um, I also designed and built Cloud Foundry, the original version of that at VMware, um, and was at Google uh, for about five years and was feeling a lot of the pain that Rob was going through with, um, I didn't have 45 minute builds, but I had about 30 minutes and I had three gig, you know, Java big blobs of things that we were trying to move around. Um, and so when I was leaving Google and I saw that, you know, Go was actually going to come out, I immediately started playing with it uh, quite a bit. Um, so why Go? Uh, I think everyone in this room, and this is pretty exciting by the way, I'm going to take a picture really quick, um, of why, that's pretty cool, um, you like the languages and, you know, you're here, that's why, especially for a first conference to have 700 people with Brian and, and Eric setting this up. It's a simple compiled language, has a great standard library, the concurrency angle that Rob talked about is important. It's a synchronous programming model. So I played a lot with uh, Node.js. And for very small things, I actually liked it quite a bit. Um, was into Ruby for a long time as well. But spent the majority of my career in C, low level C, which uh, I still have a fond heart for. Um, but moving from an asynchronous callback based methodology, which by the way, I've actually implemented in C on purpose, uh, the synchronous programming model on the coroutines that uh, are in Go was really nice. Um, garbage collection was important to me, but the thing that really got me excited about Go was stacks. Um, I used Java when it was called Oak, um, and it was a, supposedly built for a control language for uh, set-top boxes. Um, and I really didn't understand why everything had to be on the heap. Um, stacks make a lot of sense, right? You can use them. They're very, very important. The fact that Go had them, for me, was a really, really big deal. Uh, why Go? Well, it's not C and C++. Uh, I'm not a fan of C++, never have been. Um, and it kept getting more and more onerous and, and harder to actually work with. Um, and it's not Java or any JVM-based language. I think some of the most amazing low-level computer science technology came out of Sun around Java because of the fact that everything was the, on the heap. And what was really neat to me was when Go came out, it had a very, very, you know, old style um, sweep, mark and sweep garbage collector because it had stacks. And the first program I ever wrote was I wanted to test that the stacks were real and that they didn't touch the heap. Um, they did a little bit on promotion and things like that, but I was really, really impressed with why that was. Um, it's also not Ruby, uh, Python, or Node.js. Um, no disrespect to Python, but I, I got bit uh, really bad at Google in a production push on white space that was not where it was supposed to be. Um, yet I had passed my code audit and got uh, code commits for uh, Python. I still love Ruby. I like playing around with it. Deploying it into a production system and doing the dependency management on the fly like we did at Cloud Foundry um, was very, very painful and difficult. And unless you're pushing into dynamic libraries and, and C structures or C libraries, um, go build static executables. So if you're running a production system, uh, your deployment mechanism, uh, oversimplified a little bit, but it's still true, is SCP, right? Copy it there and you're, away you go, which is really nice. And again, Node.js, I still like JavaScript, um, but once you get very, very big, the, the callback spaghetti gets hard for people to understand and maintain and understand and reason about even like a week after they wrote the, the code. Um, some of you might have seen this. I usually don't do any of these types of things, but I felt really strong about the pain I had gone through trying to design, deploy, and manage a production system around Cloud Foundry built in Ruby. And the fresh air of, of Go made me put a tweet out like this, um, which I put out on September 11th of 2012 that said, I believed it was going to be the dominant language for you know, cloud infrastructure, systems infrastructure, PaaS, orchestration, whatever was the buzzword bingo at the time. Um, and you figure we're only about, uh, what, three months away or so, four months away from the two-year mark. But the fact that there's so many people here is pretty, pretty amazing in terms of uh, how it's come up. So what about high performance? Um, there's a 
messaging system that I wrote um, to underlie Cloud Foundry called NATS. Um, I've been doing messaging systems for about 25 years. Um, so it's an open source, MIT, free as in beer, open source, lightweight, publish, subscribe, uh, distributed queuing messaging system. And it serves the control plane basis for a lot of the distributed systems architectures that I've built, including um, Cloud Foundry, um, Baidu uses it quite a bit, and of course the stuff we do at Upsero. So it's subject-based, meaning messages are routed based on subjects and subject hierarchies with wildcards. It has the notion of publish subscribe, um, which again, I don't think for a lot of applications is an endpoint consumable anymore. But since Go is more around the systems language, I thought it was interesting to talk about what we did with it. Um, it's TCP IP overlay. It's not UDP based, multicast based, which I participated in and dealt with and, and helped kind of form. Um, you know, in the routers of, of the current big iron, so to speak, the only thing that's single path these days is TCP IP. And with 40 gig and 100 gig on the, on the horizon, or actually there on the optical side, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to actually try to do anything special. Matter of fact, one of the interesting things when I came to Google was the first thing I tried to play with was UDP broadcast, which within Google servers at the time, and I think it's still true, was trunked at the rack switch. And multicast was trunked at the rack switch. Actually, I don't think multicast worked at all, to be honest with you. It's clustered servers. It has lots of different clients. Um, this is a little bit uh, hard to read, maybe. Um, but this is some Go code. Um, it has a transport system. It understands type-based systems within the client. So you can create a thing called a person and just say, hey, I want to subscribe to hello as a subject. Um, and I'm going to create a person you know, there. And I'm going to publish the hello that person. And everything just kind of works. And if you look at the very top, you can see that it's actually using the JSON encoder. But they're pluggable. Um, no, no big deal there, so to speak. Um, I did a version of, of NetChan, but I didn't solve all the really hard problems. I just create channels, and I do binding operations to send and receive, and then use the NATS transports underneath. Again, it was originally written to support Cloud Foundry. We had originally used uh, RabbitMQ, which is a Erlang-based AMQP protocol, kind of an application messaging system. Um, like I said, it's used by Cloud Foundry and all of their uh, distributions, Baidu. There's a couple other within China and Japan that use it. And of course, we use it. Um, it was first written um, in about a weekend. After you've written about four or five of these things, you kind of, it's muscle memory. You know kind of the, the major pieces you got to do. Um, and we are getting close to a deadline to ship. So I wrote it in Ruby, wrote it in a weekend. It did about 150,000 messages a second on a laptop, um, circa 2009, 10 or so. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, RabbitMQ, I think, and I might be wrong on this, but I think it was about 10 or 12,000 messages a second. Um, you don't always need that power, but sometimes you do, especially at scale, um, especially in the way we actually do some of the distributed scheduling algorithms and such. At Upsera, I rewrote it in Go. Um, I don't live in the Emacs editor uh, as much as I used to, and I wish I could still, um, but I did have a pretty good fun two months learning Go. Uh, again, my first program was just the test stacks. Um, I wrote the client actually first, uh, and then I went into the server. So the first pass server, believe it or not, used regular expressions, which I know Rob did a big uh, blog about why they're there, but they're, they're just as a necessary evil, and there's usually a lot better things. But in Ruby, regular expressions are actually very fast compared to everything else that you can do. Um, <laughs> they are, because they're all the way down in the core. And Well, 190 got a little slower. I don't know where it is in 2.0. But now all of a sudden, I was at 500,000 messages a second. So very similar architecture, not a lot of, of angst, very, very fast to write. But now all of a sudden, we're at a half a million messages a second on, as you can see, I have a little 11 inch error. Um, the current per performance right now on this machine, which is a uh, 11 inch error, it's a Haswell processor, is about five, six million messages a second, depending on if I can hit all of the cache uh, infrastructure. So, how did I tune NATS, or GNATS D, which is the server? How did I get from 500K to 6 million? Now, I believe I started using uh, Go in 0.56, I think. Um, so a lot of things have changed. Um, and so some of these things, you know, I went and built, which I probably need to rip out now, uh, which is a good thing. Um, people who use Go a lot, uh, these things uh, are very familiar. These were amazingly powerful inside of Google. And that's one of the great things that Go adopted was the tooling around these types of things. I wish it worked better on Mac, but that's OK. We can put it on Linux, and it works fine. Um, you don't have to read this per se, but essentially it highlights, and this is the current code base. Uh, 
you know, where we're spending time. In any type of message system, routing system, whatever you want to call it, uh, there's three target areas, right? There's shuffling data around, and you can get very sophisticated and dip into the kernel and do special hardware and all kinds of fun stuff. But in general, within a language, there's just some basic blocking and tackling, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, but buffered reads, buffered writes, all kinds of fun stuff like that. There's protocol parsing, uh, and then there's the actual routing. And those two were the areas that were uh, the ones I concentrated on and really, really pushed on to get to those numbers. So we'll talk about protocol parsing first. Um, Rob, uh, I know, did a, a really amazing talk around uh, extremely beautiful lexer and parser and using uh, Go routines and the initialization of Go and how that actually bootstrapped itself up. Um, I went old school uh, on, on mine. Um, so Nats is a text-based protocol. Um, most people will come to me, and I had someone the other day say, well, obviously you don't know what you're doing because it should be a binary protocol. And I said, well, I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, and all the other ones I've ever done are binary protocols, but the fact that I can tell that into these servers and that the control opcodes are actually usually four characters or less means that it's actually pretty good. That there's a couple areas where you get bit, and I'm going to talk about those. Um, but it's very, very simple. So if you want to publish on the wire, what you're looking at is pub, foo.bar is the subject, two is how big the body is, you know, slash r slash n, HTTP looking like stuff, okay is the payload, and then terminate with a slash r slash n. Subscribing is similar, and there's not, it's very, very simple protocol. Um, I only had a weekend, so I couldn't get too crazy on it. Uh, again, the original Ruby version used regex, first Go re used it. But the current one is a zero allocation, byte for byte parser. So. I do not do anything except look at bytes and change state transitions. And again, it's the, the old school, and it's not necessarily as pretty, um, but it becomes very fast, especially around the zero allocation part. So you see code like this. And again, you can see it in GitHub, and it's not pretty, but it's very, very effective. So what you're seeing now is an op p, meaning we're staring at a p character. We can switch to a u, an i, or an o. u, obviously, is going down to pub, which we just showed. Um, and then, for example, we actually will go ahead and um, maintain state and maintain pointers to the arguments within the byte buffer as long as we don't split, right? So if we don't split, meaning the actual buffer that you handed me runs out and we're still in the middle of pointing to arguments and we haven't gotten everything together, um, we just actually point to the things within the byte buffer and we just use slices, right? Go slices are one of the most powerful things. The fact that you don't use low, low arrays and use slices um, is, I think, overlooked a lot, but it's extremely powerful, and I'm very appreciative of that. Um, now, this one actually says, okay, now we actually have the arguments, right? We need to actually process on these things. And again, it's a zero allocation, meaning I don't want to do any type of allocations, even necessarily on the stack. And so if you actually look at this code, it's, it's kind of hard to, to uh, go through in detail, but what it's doing is it's just maintaining pointers within the byte buffer, and when we get all of the arguments that we want, Remember, it's the subject, the length of the payload, and then the payload itself. We can actually call into um, a process statement with the actual state that's a tie to the client. So every client comes in, we formulate some state, we have pointers, and then, of course, we're also going to do the, the necessary if we do a split buffer. So, for example, a pub arg looks like this, right? We, we hold on to um, slices for the subject, the reply, SID doesn't matter, uh, size bytes, size. Uh, size is, as it's being parsed, so I only parse it once and I pass it all the way around. And then the parse state again is these arg buffs and message buffs where we point into things. And then at the end you'll see this thing called scratch. And so there's a max control line uh, by design within the protocol, so I actually put a scratch buffer attached to the client so that if I do a split buffer, meaning I'm like, oh, P, U, B, space, 2, end. Right? I have to hold on to some state there because when I come back in I'm going to pick up where I left off, but I need to actually have those. And what happens in the very bottom there is, is that I'm actually realizing that I'm stuck in the middle. I've ran out of bytes, you know, I ran out of input for this pass within the parser. And I'm actually going to flip and swip thing, uh, swap things out for copy versions in that scratch buffer. And I just reuse that on the fly. Some tidbits. Um, early on, defer was extremely costly. I love defer. I remember having to walk through massive C code and figure out why well, I locked the mutex there and did I unlock it here and I'm escaping out here. Um, and so I immediately said, I'm going to use defer everywhere, um, especially in terms of releasing locks. Um, 
Now, 1.3, I believe, is getting a lot better at it. Um, but early on, defers were extremely uh, penal. Uh, also, it's a text-based protocol. So I don't care about switching on the control ops. I get that part, and I actually think this actually works as fast as a binary because you don't have the Indian problem that you have to figure out which way you're going, especially if you have more than uh, two bytes. Um, but stirconf parse int was also very slow. It was doing allocations underneath the covers, and I had to parse that um, body length, that two, right, and hold on to it. Um, and so I thought the language was great, and I knew that they were getting better faster. I call it the VHS versus Betamax argument. Um, but I wrote some tests, right? And I wrote, okay, how, how penal is a defer, at least in terms of where we are? And so I have it for 103, 112, and 121. And if you notice, it's a very simple, normal benchmark. Everybody sees these things. I call into a function, and it either says defer unlock or it just unlocks in place. And you can see that it's pretty expensive, especially in the 103. Um, you know, we're looking at probably a 3x hit. Uh, it's still running fairly fast, but if I was looking at, my magic number, by the way, is to get to 5 million messages a second, be able to process. Not necessarily move all the bytes if it was a massive payload, but do the framing, understand the framing, do the switching, do the subject routing, things like that. I had to look at those type of things. And again, Golang 1.3, uh, I don't get to spend as much time in Emacs anymore, uh, but I do read the release notes that came out, as I think Andrew posted, and it says that defer has gotten a lot faster. Um, and so one of the things I'm going to talk about at the very end is the fact that Go as a language and an ecosystem and community is getting better, faster. Um, so there's no defers for the most part within the, the GNSD code base, right? They're all out, and I kind of went old school and said, okay, I'm escaping here. I got to unlock it. I got to unlock it here. I also went into parse size, and again, this isn't something that I think you know, people who are writing the standard library should have had to change, right? This was just something that I was like, I want to make this thing as fast as possible. I only cared about positive integers, right? So I get to cheat a little bit. I don't have all the nasty stuff. And, and I think if you actually look at everything that can be a number, parse int within the circconf library is actually very, very well done. It's very, very complex to actually parse a number. I get to cheat because my numbers are just always positive. There's no leading plus or minuses. Otherwise, the protocol parser just breaks. Um, and so I have a very simple, uh, trivially simple uh, parser, but it works. And I have an int64 version as well. Now, on these, if you look at parse size versus the circconf stuff, again, on 103, um, you know, it was 2.x, 2x or so uh, faster than the built-in one for 103. What's interesting, though, is it's actually my little hacked version, which is, again, right for what I wanted to do, with 1 to 1, it's actually three and a half times faster, right? So we're down to 10 nanoseconds uh, per op on uh, my version, and uh, right now uh, parse int um, instead of circconf is about 35 nanoseconds. And again, looking back to that one graph, the performance graph, you know, you have all of this at your disposal. That's the amazing thing I think about Go, and it's not that I was sitting around waiting for the Go team to change things, right? They have these primitives that uh, make the language incredibly easy to use, but if you want to tinker and you want to get down in and you buy in into the Kool-Aid of, of share by message passing, but no, I want to put a mutex and lock something up and have it accessed concurrently, you can do that. So the second big target area outside of um, protocol parsing was the subject and routing. Now, this is an area that's kind of interesting, and, and Brad Fitz and I had a conversation one time um, uh, in the Embarcadero in San Francisco, and we talked about um, some things that I was struggling with. And the very first one was the fact that it's a byte slice coming off of the wire that I'm looking at. And you can't use a byte slice as a key to a internal Go map, right? And I wanted to do a map. Um, I've done five different data structures for these routing things throughout my career. Um, a subject router does simple things, matches subjects to subscribers. Currently, I use a tree of nodes and hash maps, so it's just a tree all the way down, so it can match from one to n. Um, mine has a front-end dynamic eviction cache. So in other words, what I do is I can actually walk the trees and actually build a resulted set that I can dynamically change, um, but I don't want that thing to grow unbounded in terms of the fast path. And so I give it a fixed size, and I want those things just randomly being evicted on the fly. 
Um, and again, the, I needed to use a byte slice as the key. Um, I didn't want to use unsafe, although I do use unsafe in some low-level stuff, especially around hash and hash maps, which we'll talk about. Um, but if you take a byte slice and you convert it to a string, that's an allocation and that's expensive and penal. So I didn't want to do that. Built using hashing algorithms, again, on byte. Uh, built on hash maps with byte keys, uh, as we talked about. So this is a whole bunch of hashing algorithms that I tried one weekend. Um, they're all coded up. They're all available. I only use one of them right now, uh, but they're all MIT licensed. They're uh, you know, applicable to a lot of algorithms that I didn't design, obviously, and I tried to make sure that they're all attributed correctly. But you know, Bernstein, which is very, very old school, but if you look at it, it's extremely fast, especially if I use the GCC Go compiler on small keys. It was still the best. Uh, but you've got Murmur 3, and you've got the whole you know, um, derivatives of the FN D1A type stuff. Um, now, Gesturus is actually probably the best, at least from um, the results that I got, and so that's what I use. So I have the notion of small keys, like tokens, like foo.bar.baz. And then I put foo.bar.baz together in the frontline cache, which is a medium size. I picked up to about 64 for some of my tests, 64 characters or so, um, to try to optimize on. And so this is actually the code for the Gesturus hashing algorithm. And you can see that there's a lot of ungo-like things in here, right? I'm using unsafe. I'm using all kinds of tricks to convert byte arrays into N64s. You know, depending on the fact that x86 processors are very, very good at not having to be word aligned, and they can figure that out for themselves. The old Solaris boxes for those who remember that, if you did that, it would crash the, the program instantaneously. Um, and so a lot of interesting things here, but it actually was going very, very fast. And so when I plug this into my own hash map uh, algorithm, um, you can see now that this one's reversed. And so for go one to one, I believe it was in one one actually, the built-in map started using low-level primitives of the processor. That made it extremely fast. But if you look all the way down at the bottom at 103, um, go map is obviously the built-in structure, and then hash map is the one that I wrote. Um, we were close to five times faster for small keys. And then for medium keys, let's see, we were seven times faster, um, and about three x faster for large keys. So when Go was first put out, again, you know, the maps now, as you can see, and, and you'll hear me say this a lot, um, because if the ecosystem language community is getting better faster, um, but originally, you know, it was slow, right? It was slower than I wanted it to be. And if you look at, um, you know, 19 uh, million operations per second for the Go map for one token, if I had three tokens and I wanted to achieve five million messages a second, I was pretty much at my, my wit's end already. Um, so you need a lot of room as you're stacking all these things up to actually reach your end goal. But, as again, as you go up within the, the results here and you get to one to one, um, it's killing me, right? In terms of the small is at uh, 132 million operations per second, um, 207 for the medium, right? There's, they're now tying into some low level processors within our uh, processor instructions, which is great. The only thing is, is that, and again, you saw in the hashes, I will use unsafe, but I'm trying not to. If I don't use unsafe to cast the byte slice into a string, all right, I take a hit on the allocation and all of that kind of goes away. Um, but I believe, you know, Brad uh, at least expressed to me that that's something that he would love to see go away if it's all possible. We don't know if it is or not, but, um, you know, I can always use unsafe and cast it. And obviously, it's a lot faster than what I did. And so, Hopefully, as everyone in here uh, who's, who's a die-hard programmer and who's been doing this for quite a long time, um, if you get a chance to throw your own code away, that's great. You always want to be able to throw your own code away. And so I'm looking forward to ripping this, this stuff out. But at the time, you know, it was necessary, and I wanted to get to that, that magic number. So in terms of some lesson learned, um, the tooling within Go and, and what was brought from both the expertise of the team that designed the language and then the tooling that was inside of uh, Google hopefully is not lost on anybody in this room. There's some amazing tools. Yes, um, I was a big diehard GDB fan. I lived in that in Emacs for about two or three years until I really started doing um, concurrent and parallel programming. I know they're different. Um, and then I went right back to print line, essentially. And that's what I've been using ever since. Um, 
But the tooling around uh, profile analysis and things like that is very, very good, and it's getting better. We have coverage now. I think it's actually now uh, covers uh, uh, CGO within the 1.3 uh, beta. Um, avoid short-lived objects. If anyone in here is programmed in Java a lot, I would imagine you had uh, two things that you would do and probably not really like. One was figure out how to make less garbage. So restructure your program to be more heap friendly. And then at least at Google with the, the Ajax APIs um, uh, service that we ran, I spent two days on Java garbage collection flags. Literally two days just looking at it, trying all different combinations to kind of get the thing to work where it didn't hiccup. And um, I think it was literally eight pages of, of documentation from Sun. Um, but with Go, right, it's, you don't have to necessarily worry about restructuring your program, although I think you should every once in a while take a look at how you're processing things. You can use the stack, right? And I noticed that in 1.2.1, we went from 4K to 8K, and they were, I think, non-contiguous. And now 1.3 is putting them back to 4K, but they're contiguous. I think we take a hit up front now. I, again, I don't live in Emacs. I just live in email, and I saw the, the thing go by. Um, benchmark some of the standard library built-ins, right? But again, the, the community is getting better so much faster. Um, I don't have any issues with that. But if you have to, you can go in and do your own version of it, right? Um, I programmed in Erlang, and I remember doing that. Um, I don't want to do that. I, I, like, I like Go. Um, benchmark the built-ins, too. And again, I think you know, I'm not the only one that was running into some of the defer stuff, and I want to put defers back in. I don't like having to do the accounting and make sure that I'm doing all the right stuff. Um, but I'll, by the way, the, the other great flag is if you have an automated test framework, Travis, um, there's a whole bunch of other cool ones now, uh, more cool, I guess, than Travis, whatever, Please run everything with Mice Race. It's an amazing tool. It really is. Um, I'm amazed at how many Go programs these days don't, and I'll do it, and it breaks. Um, by the way, that's not because I was on top of it from day one. The team at AppSera actually said, hey, have you ever run GNETSD with Minus Race? I'm like, I didn't even know it existed. And they go, you should probably do that. And I did, and it you know, was spitting all kinds of stuff out. So uh, I think Russ was responsible for that or some of the other people in the Go team. Um, and at least for now, channels on very, very performance critical stuff, you know, they might not be what, what you want. Um, but what was my big lesson learned? Again, I really pushed the team at AppSera to look at it. As I left VMware, I told the whole Cloud Foundry team, stop doing this, go to go. And I think, you know, most of the code base is being rolled over as we speak. Um, but the big lesson is, is Go is a good choice for performance-based systems. I still like C, I just don't want to program it anymore. Life's too short, I don't have enough time. Um, I, I, I just don't. It takes so much time to get it right. Um, I just don't. And Go flows very well with the way I think. Um, people pick it up very, very quickly. So as a founder of a company, I don't have to worry about those types of things. And again, it's getting better faster than all the others, in my opinion. I think all of us in this room owe a lot of, of gratitude and debt to the team, not only for the original design, and to Rob's point that he talked about this morning, about saying enough's enough, but what the language is and represents, they're still iterating on it, and they're still looking at some hard things, and they make some hard decisions, right? Don't know about a debugger. Don't know if it's going to happen. Um, but obviously, the defer things come up because people were looking at it and working on it, and uh, it's uh, an amazing language. So thank you. Um, I think I did good on my timing. Um, and then on some of the resources for uh, Nats, again, it's free as in beer. Um, please use it. Thank you, Derek.